Hello and welcome. My name is Katie Close. I am Edinburgh University's PRSSA chapter president. And I would just like to thank you all for coming to our fall symposium. Tonight we'll be having four speakers, as you can see. And I have the pleasure of introducing our president, Dr. Woolman. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for waiting for us to get started. Edinburgh University has a tradition of hosting distinguished speakers, a tradition of engaging students, staff, and invited experts in thought-provoking explorations of current issues, and a tradition of welcoming home our graduates to share the expertise they've built on the solid foundation of an Edinburgh education. Tonight, we're fortunate enough to do all three. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our panelists and to all of you. Welcome to the first Tracking Trends and Managing Issues Symposium with terrorism, technology, globalization, and sustainability on the table the discussion is sure to be intriguing. I want to give special thanks to the university's communication and media studies department, and especially to its chairperson, Dr. Tony Peyronel, for creating this symposium in collaboration with our Public Relations Student Society of America chapter and the Northwestern Pennsylvania chapter of the Public Relations Society of America. I am really excited to hear what our accomplished alumni, Jack Spear, Amy Reynolds, and Vanessa Herring, and our distinguished panelist, Patrick Govang, have to say tonight. I hope you are as well. Welcome. Now I'd like to introduce Jessica Kuntz, a broadcast journalism major here at Edinburgh University. She's involved with ETV, among other activities, and she is going to introduce to you the Friends of Communication Fund. Jessica? As Dr. Woolman said, my name is Jessica Coons, and I am a junior here at Edinburgh. Um, before I start, I just have to say that I'm not only honored, but I feel really lucky to be here tonight in the presence of all of you and to be able to talk to you, but more importantly, to get to listen and to learn. Um, as Dr. Woolman said, I'm a junior majoring in broadcast journalism, and during my time here, I've been very involved with my major and in the communication and media studies department. Within the first few weeks of my freshman year here, I got involved at both the radio and TV stations on campus. I immediately signed up for a radio show and I tried out for ETV. For two years, I co-hosted a weekly radio show and I am currently working as assignment editor at ETV as well as reporting and anchoring. Getting involved right away at both organizations really gave me a unique opportunity to network with people both on and off campus. I've been able to interview musicians, professionals in the field of communication, and host campus events. My classes have given me a solid foundation in writing and learning what it takes to be a journalist. They were learning experiences that made me think outside the box, work hands-on, and test myself. My professors have pushed me to work to my fullest potential, even when I fought them on it. When I came to Edinburgh, I received the Dr. Bob Wallace Communication Scholarship and the Pitzer Rupnik Scholarship. It's an honor to be able to have a connection to someone like Dr. Wallace, who made a significant impact on this department. And despite the fact that I never had the chance to meet him, I feel like I know him. To me, this is a reflection of what this department is about. It's a moving, fluctuating group of people who at one point or another have all spent time here, and whether they know it or not, they're bonded. 
My time here at Edinburgh and working with campus media and being a student in this department is irreplaceable. I am beyond grateful for the opportunities I've had to, I've had the people I've been able to meet, the stories I've been able to tell, and the work I've been able to do. I can only hope that every student who enters this department is able to experience the same things I've been able to. In an effort to continue providing educational opportunities for its students, the department created the Friends of Communication Fund in 2011. This fund raises support for the department in areas of student scholarships, campus media funding, special events, and guest speakers. If you picked up a program on the way in, you will have received a Friends of Communication donation card inside. Take the time to consider a donation for a fund that not only supports this department, but future professionals in the field of communications. My college career would not be what it is if I had been anyplace else, and I know that there's an entire group of future journalists who will back me up on that. So thank you for listening and for considering donating to the Friends of Communication Fund. Your support will make an impact. Thank you. Good evening, uh, my name is Tony Perrinell. I'm the chair of the Department of Communication and Media Studies here at Edinburgh University. Uh, I'm also the faculty advisor to the, our chapter of the Public Relations Student Society of America. And finally, uh, I'm a board member and a past president of the Northwest Pennsylvania chapter of the Public Relations Society of America. That is the organization that sponsors our student chapter. So in my roles uh, in, with all of those groups who have joined to, to sponsor tonight's event, uh, I welcome you. Uh, I wanna thank uh, President Woolman for taking time out of her schedule to be here with us this evening. And I wanna thank the two fantastic students who you've already heard from, uh, Jess Kuntz, uh, as she said, the holder of the Dr. Bob Wallace Scholarship and uh, Katie Close, the PRSSA chapter president, because Katie uh, really did uh, the bulk of the legwork for this event in terms of obtaining uh, funding from the Edinburgh University Student Government Association and working closely with those students. Uh, the university, the Friends of Communication, and Edinburgh University SGA all provided funding to this event, so credit to Katie for all the work she did in terms of her relationship with SGA. Um, I have several colleagues from the department who are here tonight, as I expect, as we tend to turn out to support these kind of events. And uh, one of them is a guy named Tony Esposito, who I once heard describe communication professors as being loquacious. Being the humble sort of a guy I am, I didn't realize that that meant we tend to be talkative. We talk a lot, I guess. So uh, you have a wonderful program in front of you that was prepared by uh, Bill Berger of the university's uh, public relations and marketing communication staff. So I won't give a traditional introduction since one of the labels I wear is as a communication professor, I'll tell a moderately short story about how this evening came together. This summer I had the privilege uh, of being invited to the Scripps Howard Leadership Workshop that is funded by the Scripps Howard News Organization, but it's hosted by the Manship School of Mass Communication on the campus of LSU, and it was there that I had one of the strangest small world experiences in my career when on that Sunday evening, amid people from the Annenberg School at the University of Southern California and other, quote, name institutions, I got ready to do my routine. Who I was, where I was from, Edinburgh's not in Scotland, and I got cut off politely but the director of the program said, you don't need to tell us one word about Edinburgh University. Our graduate dean is a distinguished alum of your school. 
And so in, in one of the bizarre, most bizarre small world moments in my career, I was introduced to Amy Reynolds, who grew up here in Edinburgh. Uh, her dad, Tom, was the assistant chair of the psychology department for many years. Her mom, Judy, worked in learning support. To make it even a stranger story, I took doctoral courses with her mother in the late 1990s. So I come back to campus and I'm all excited about this experience and I'm having a conversation with Tim Thompson, our assistant chair, and I'm telling him this same story. Yeah, she's written four or five books. One of them is on uh, the me uh, terrorism's impact on the media. She's fantastic. Tim, we're bringing her back. We're bringing her back. We're bringing her back to speak. And when I get excited about it, that's sort of how animated I get. And so Tim says, well, that's great, but you know, I want to talk to you about a speaker too. Uh, I know this guy real well. His name is Pat Govang. He worked in the auto industry. He's a great uh, product development guy. He worked in materials research at Cornell University, and now he spun that off to this very successful green technology company called E2E Materials. And, you know, he's not an alum. He went to Bowling Green. Three of our faculty members have degrees from Bowling Green, so he's probably technically a, a, an honorary alum. Uh, and so I said, Tim, maybe we're, we're going about this the wrong way. They're not individual speakers. I said, look at the expertise they bring. I mean, media, terrorism, political communication, sustainability, a whole variety of eco issues. Those two people can, in, we could do a C-SPAN level panel on emerging issues and trends, which is very important to public relations professionals because that aspect of their job is often overlooked. And then I said, you know what, Tim? And I kind of threw my arms like that. And I said, Jack Spear. If we bring back Jack Spear, we've got a C-SPAN worthy panel. We had brought Jack from National Public Radio back four years ago, almost to the day. You needed someone loquacious. <laughs> and, and you know what? That's, that's how, simple the, how simply the idea was conceived. We, we made three calls and emails, they all said yes, and that left us just with two questions. When do we have it, and who moderates it? We, we knew October is a busy time of month, there are a ton of things going, around, going on on campus this evening, but we thought we're going to be in the eve of a presidential election. It's going to be just a couple of weeks before our new president is formally inaugurated, and I would encourage you to look at the university website because many of those events are open to the public, so I would urge your participation to come back and join with us in a couple of weeks when, to be part of Dr. Woolman's inauguration. So that was a part of the timing. And then that left us only with who would moderate. And, you know, our faculty could, a lot of people could. We went back and forth. We might have spent more time on that, and we thought, how about a successful alumni journalist? And we have quite a few of them. So. We tossed it around, we tossed it around, and we ended up with Vanessa Herring, who at the time was anchoring and reporting for uh, the Lilly Broadcasting Stations here in, Easy, here in Erie, the NBC and CBS affiliates. Well, um, the reason for our later start is Vanessa threw us a curve, and she's already moved on to WROC-TV uh, in Rochester. And so she, uh, we really appreciate, by the way, Bill Clinton is coming to Rochester tomorrow, and that's a big part of the reason why Vanessa's schedule was altered such, so she had trouble getting here today, and I understand she's also got to leave to be back early tomorrow, so thank you. But um, I want to say just a couple words about Vanessa, and, and we're really proud of her success. Uh, I got permission from my wife to say that my wife really misses her because she loved watching her anchor on the CW at 10 o'clock. Every night she would say, how nice Vanessa looks. What a dress Vanessa's wearing. She really does a great job. She, she really is a great example for your department. So, you know, Vanessa, I just want to warn you, if an attractive lady who looks around my age comes up to you after this event, <laughs> we have a 25-year-old son who lives and works in your hometown of Pittsburgh. You know how moms are. Uh, but that's not why we invited her back. Of course, 
you need an on-camera presence. You need a polished delivery. Anyone who tells you you don't need that to be successful in television news is delusional. But you need more than that. And the reason we invited Vanessa back is because many of us had her in class. We know that she is intelligent. She's a great writer. In fact, for many, many months before she ever appeared on camera in Erie, she worked as a producer at WICU, which I was astounded by. But it's a reflection of how strong her skills are, how hardworking she is, how intelligent she is, and how she understands the issues. And tonight is about issues, and it's my honor to turn this evening over to Edinburgh University graduate and WROC TV reporter and anchor, Vanessa Heron. Thank you. I thought, I thought you were going to say you asked me to moderate because I always say yes. But you knew I would say yes. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, this evening with all of you. And um, we're kind of going to get started with questions that will sort of introduce our panelists to you a little bit better. Um, so we are actually going to start with Pat. And Pat, I'd just like you to tell us a little bit more about your, your company, E2E Materials, and, and why the company's way of doing business is, is critical to the future. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody for organizing this event. It's been a great meeting, folks, and uh, the president and the provost, and Tony, and thank you, Tim. Uh, uh, it's great to be here tonight to tell a little bit of the uh, story about E2E Materials. Um, E2E is company that was founded on some technology that was developed at Cornell University. And the basics of what we do is we take soy flour and grass fibers and put them together and create a composite material, something we call a biocomposite, that replaces wood. And if you look around this room, you'll probably see plenty of examples of where wood was used. And the, the company itself was not just a replacement for wood. If you think about you know, the fact that trees have been around forever, and when we were starting the company, we said, you know, wow, this could be a really big business, and this could be something really cool if we could replace wood. So we started thinking about what type of business we would be, and that kind of leads into how we define sustainability. Sustainability can be defined so many different ways. If we asked everybody in the room, we'd probably come up with as many definitions as there are people here. So how we define sustainability, we thought about E2E and its potential to be a big company. We said, well, big corporations today don't have the best rap, and maybe we can design a corporation that actually contributes to the solutions of some major problems out there. And the, the three problems that we focused on were overpopulation, deforestation, and energy consumption. And one of the, the facts that had always startled me, I had actually spent part of my career living and working in India, where the population is so, the people, there's so many more people than there are here in the US. And in my lifetime alone, I'm 46 years old, the world's population has more than doubled. And that is just historically astounding. And to think about the shock that that is putting our, on our planet, it doesn't matter where you stand politically on global warming or anything like that. It's this, we have so many more mouths to feed and so many homes to build and so many uh, uh, places for these people to have a quality life like one that we enjoy here in the US. And so leading that off of that is we've got a lot more people on the planet now than we ever had before. We said, well, how does that play out? And you know, we looked at deforestation as an issue. And humanity so far this year, is, so far humanity has deforested about half the planet. And that's not all bad. I mean, we've developed and we've built and we've done a lot of great things. But we've got a, a forestry industry right now that uh, depletes the forestry at about 40 million acres per year. There's about 11 billion acres of uh, trees on the planet today. So if you do some quick math, that's about 275 years of trees. And that's not really that big of a problem. But when you think about the fact that 300 million Americans consume 70% of those wood products, and we've got 6.7 billion people, the majority of which are aspiring to live a life like we do and have a home like we have and furnish it like we do and have an office and schools in the way that we do that. Um, you take those numbers and you say, well, what if all those people consumed wood at the rate and products made out of wood at the rate that we do? Well, that number becomes 840 million. And you divide that into 11 billion, that's about less than 15 years worth of trees. 
Now, is the answer there, is it 275 or 15? It really didn't matter to us. It just said to us that there's a problem here that we can uh, contribute to the solution of by diverting products away from being made out of trees. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we do that. Um, and then lastly, we looked at the energy consumption. Um, most of the wood products today are not just made out of a piece of solid wood. They're wood that are, is ground up. There takes energy to grind that up into fine particles, and it's glued together with a glue that has formaldehyde in it. And that's called particle board and medium density fiber board. Most of the stuff you buy from IKEA is made out of wood product like that. And the energy consumption that goes into making that, we looked at how much went in and how much it took to make our stuff, and we realized we were about 80% less. Um, so having much lower embodied energy in the products that we could make out of the material seemed pretty significant. Uh, it actually, in the North American market, equated to about a little over 2 billion pounds of CO2. And that's a big number. Um, and actually, we kind of said, well, what does that mean? And we looked at the comparative impact to, um, or we looked at what else has had a similar impact. And it's actually about every Toyota Prius on the road so far has had about a similar impact on the CO2 of the planet. So we said, hey, that's, that's pretty cool. So we think we could design a business that can actually contribute to solving all three of those problems by just being, not being better or not trying to make a better, you know, uh, make a, a product greener than it was. So we started off thinking about how the technology we had was unique. And the technology that we licensed out of Cornell, as I said, takes soy flour and grass fibers. And we put it together in a way that is much stronger than wood. It's actually about four times stronger. So when you take a material that's stronger, you can make a product that's better. Higher strength is generally better. And you can take weight out of it. So if you've ever moved that piece of IKEA furniture you may ha have, you know that it's not light. Um, if you've ever taken it apart and tried to put it back together, it's not a very elegant material at all. Um, so we could make stuff that was stronger and lighter, and that would be better. And then we also looked at the unique capability of our technology to be formed three-dimensionally. So today this industry takes a flat panel, and the manufacturers that make this furniture cut it and saw it and drill it and route it and assemble it into a part where we could take and form it right into that part. And when we did that, we were cost-effective. So we looked at the products that were out there today, and we said, we can make cabinetry, furniture, building products, anything that's made out of wood today, more cost effective than it's done today by taking process steps out and being efficient, using less energy, and making stuff that's actually not a less than or almost than product that costs more being green, but makes stuff that is actually better and stronger that people are going to want, that Americans are going to want. And hence, everybody else in the world will want that. We thought that was pretty cool. And then we also looked at how the material came to be and thought, rethought how the material was manufactured. And so it wasn't just what it was and what the products were that we were making, but how they were being made. And we went to Walmart and we picked the desk off, off the shelf and we brought it back to the shop and we tore it all apart and we looked at it. And we started digging into that. And what we learned was the wood that went into that desk was actually, uh, that desk was manufactured in China. Uh, the wood that went into it came from Canada and the Northwest United States and was shipped over to China to be manufactured into the panels. The petrochemical components that went into making that were derived out of the Middle East. And then it was assembled into the product and shipped all the way back to the United States and put on a train and transferred all the way across the country in a truck and it ended up on a shelf. And we calculated all that out and there was about 21,000 miles that was on that desk, all cum cumulatively. That's about three quarters of the way around the planet. So if you think about the fact that petroleum is contributing to the cost of all of those miles and the fact that petroleum is, you know, it's not a question of if it's going to go up, it's when it's going to go up in price, that business model becomes less and less viable. So we looked at how could we change that? How can we do that differently? And we came up with a concept we call regionally integrated manufacturing. And there, we looked at our feedstocks, which were grass fibers. We can use 27, one of 27 different grass fibers to go into the material itself. And they can grow all over the world. So we have the world covered, and we can get fiber from anywhere. And we said, if we can grow that fiber around the production facility, we can take a lot of those miles out. And if we can look at the regionalization of a business, 
where we can manufacture something and ship it within a 500 mile radius around that production facility, we can take that 21,000 miles down to less than 500. And we thought that was pretty cool. And the side benefit of that, we just opened up uh, our first uh, manufacturing facility in Geneva, New York this year to pilot that. And we're working with the USDA to grow flax there to get that fiber uh, source developed so that we can actually prove that business model out. But the neat thing about that, and one of the things that I'm personally uh, passionate about is manufacturing and manufacturing jobs. So at the height of manufacturing in the US, it was 63% of our GDP. Today, it's less than 11%. And I grew up uh, in the shadow of the automotive industry. My aunts and uncles all worked in the auto industry. And my cousins today that still live in that area really struggle to have the quality of life that my aunts and uncles had growing up. And that, to me, is just tragic. And so when we looked at that manufacturing capability, we went to New York State and we said, look, there's an economic development factor for every type of business that's out there, every type of thing. So if, if you buy something in a store, it has about a 1x impact on that economy. For every dollar of manufacturing, it has about a 3x impact on that economy. And for an agricultural product, it has about a 7x. We so we can take all of those and combine them into the same region and come up with something that has true economic power that creates what we like to think are truly the green collar jobs of the future. That's agricultural and manufacturing and all working together to make products that are better than what are out there today. And uh, those three areas, uh, thinking about big problems and building a business that can, can contribute to the solution of those by having a regional model that, once we prove it in New York, can easily be duplicated all around the country, and for that matter, can be taken to China and India and Brazil and, and other areas where the population can grow their own fibers in and have a regionally integrated manufacturing model as well. So we saw it's something that could scale for the planet. I mentioned earlier the population growth, the fibers that we use are harvested every year. It takes about 20 years to grow a tree. And actually we get about 20x the output on an acre of land of fiber than you do with an acre of southern yellow pine. So it gives us a feedstock that alleviates the deforestation, deforestation issue as well. And the energy thing I had talked about. So it's those three areas and uh, building a company that can do that. Very good, very interesting. Uh, we're gonna move down to, to Amy, and Amy, you have, you've written or edited five books, and um, they focus on how the media covers terrorism. So how, do, how, how has that issue changed journalism, and what is the impact of that issue on the consumers? Thanks, um, let me also echo um, Pat's thank, thanks to all of you for having us here, to Tony and everyone, um, it's wonderful to come back. Um, and to see fall leaves. In Louisiana, we don't have fall color, so <laughs> I've been missing that. Um, so, so the terrorism book, so a lot of my research, I sort of look at two different um, areas of media. On the one side, I try to look at um, what we often call media sociology, how the media works, what are the different factors that can change the way a journalist does his or her job. Um, and so my interest in coverage of terrorism really grew out of that. But related to that, I also um, have done a lot of work and focus on First Amendment history, um, thinking about the need for dissent, the importance of dissent in a, in a democracy, and looking at unpopular ideas. So in some ways, coverage of terrorism sort of pulls those two things together. Of course, terrorism and dissent aren't the same things, right? Because dissent doesn't come with violence. Um, but as I started to sort of study some questions about how different environments might impact journalists. In graduate school, I was struck when I was watching the continuous coverage of the Oklahoma City bombing at how quickly the media jumped to the conclusion that this must be Middle Eastern terrorists, that this had a very clear sort of signature, and that the role of the journalist really at the outset, because the, the job was to get information out as quickly as possible. And sometimes we don't think about that now because we really live in a 24-7 news culture all the time. Um, but back then it was really mostly the cable news networks that provided that um, for most people. And so as I was watching the Oklahoma City bombing coverage, it was really striking to me how much it seemed that the, the primary news value was speed. You know, accuracy, of course, journalists don't want to get a story wrong. But when you're pushed up against trying to get information out there as quickly as humanly possible, when there's not always information to be had, 
Um, it can create inaccuracies in reporting and other problems. And so when I think about how terrorism has changed journalism, I really do kind of think that September 11th was, was a key turning point. In terms of what, it, what happened to the role of the journalist, um, one of the things that I think was really um, striking was how difficult it was for journalists to sort of step outside of what was happening. That, that's just human nature. I don't think it's reasonable to expect journalists not to be human, not to be reacting to what was going on. Um, but there was really a lot of um, talk very quickly in that coverage about the need for military action and moving to war. Now, journalists weren't saying this, but the sources that they brought on, which were disproportionately you know, governmental kinds of sources, it skewed the coverage in such a way that it was, I think, next to impossible for a journalist in the U.S. to step outside of that story and attempt to be objective or balanced. That doesn't mean to say the coverage wasn't good. I actually think a lot of the coverage of September 11th was very, very good. And I think that journalists took on a bit of a different role, right? For a lot of people, it was reassurance. Um, we didn't cut away to commercials. We didn't necessarily, um, we tried to create a presence that, that was calming and, and reinforcing. What was challenging about that, though, is that while journalists, I think, were working to do that, television news in particular, which is what I have studied mostly, was running looped video feeds, particularly in that initial breaking moment of things like the airplane, the second plane crashing into the building, um, you know, the smoke clouds. You often probably remember those images of the time. So on the one hand, you have journalists sort of trying to promote calm, but yet you've got a split screen technique and you've got information coming out that is, is so um, disturbing to people. That, that the whole thing sort of, I think, um, had, a, had a difficult effect on people. And so if you look at how September 11th may have changed journalism um, in that sense, I think it helped raise awareness that the role of the journalist is much more complicated than we sometimes think it is, right? It's not always easy to step back and be a detached observer. And that there are sometimes consequences to that. So for example, not long after that, people who expressed an alternative viewpoint, again, not making judgments of what views are right or wrong, but if you expressed an alternative viewpoint, there wasn't room for that in the conversation. The country wasn't ready for that. But yet, journalists are taught, that's my responsibility and goal, right? To bring these other ideas in. But that was very, very difficult to, to have happen during September 11th. So I think that's one important thing. The second thing I'll mention is I think that the fact that you had a response that, that involved the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and an expansion of, of government in an effort to try to prevent future terrorism attacks, right? The idea that we have to be able to protect our infrastructure. We have to find ways for the private sector to work with government. So for example, if um, we're worried that a terrorist might uh, put something poisonous in our water stream, right, and attack people that way, that there has to be some sharing of information between the private sector and the governmental sector. And the, the Department of Homeland Security was really, I think, the, the appropriate place to put to facilitate that sharing. But as part of trying to collect that information, much of it very sensitive information, um, there were put in place additional um, exemptions under the Freedom of Information Act. And so we had something emerge called the Critical Infrastructure um, information exemption, and the idea was that if we're going to ask companies to put forth sometimes even proprietary and other information, we need to not release that to the press. I think most people support that exemption, but I think as you started to see the way information was limited um, sort of over the years, people became much more reliant on um, government to tell them what was going on in a terrorism-related story rather than sort of try to figure out ways to, to, to do investigative work that might challenge something. Again, not to say that you think the government is evil or bad or anything, but just in that spirit of being a watchdog press. But then it was much more difficult for journalists to get that information. And a lot of those trends started after the Oklahoma City bombing. There was terrorism legislation that was introduced, or anti-terrorism legislation introduced um, after Oklahoma City. But the Patriot Act and a couple of subsequent acts really sort of tightened that. And I think a lot of journalists felt like it was going to be much more difficult to get information and to figure out how you communicate that information in a way that holds the government accountable but doesn't put people's safety at risk. And so I think that's another sort of important evolution. I don't think yet 
we have a handle on what all that means and how all of that, that works, except to say that we have moved from a period of being, I think, overly sensitive to every single um, act of violence being an act of terrorism, which was often a, a narrative within journalism not that long after 9-11, through the first even three or four or five years. Some of you may even remember when the um, space shuttle uh, uh, Columbia exploded, there were even narratives about that could be terrorism. Um, you know, that sort of went away, but I find it interesting that it almost overcorrected so that when the embassy um, violence occurred and we had the, uh, the four Americans killed in Libya just within the past month on the anniversary, no one initially went to terrorism, right? So that wouldn't have happened even, I think, two or three or four years ago. All right, thank you, Amy. And uh, Jack, you kind of get both <laughs> because you've worked as a business journalist for many years and you also covered the uh, September 11th uh, terrorist attacks. So can you kind of speak to both topics that, we, that we've just kind of opened up? Sure. Um, first, I do want to say, though, thank you to the um, PRSSA for having me um, and along with everyone else and Katie and everyone else for driving me around today. It was great. Um, it seems like every four years I get the call to come to Edinburgh. I was last year, uh, four years ago, I think it was this month, right before the election. So I'm going to put that on my calendar, Tony, uh, 2016, just write it in now so in case you call me again, I'll have an open date. Um, I think that the issue of the economy and, and and terrorism too, actually, we're, we're definitely linked on September 11th. Um, I talked to Amy a little bit when we were coming over about, um, and, and I think I called it almost like the national hand-holding, which is sort of trivializing it a bit, but maybe not too much. There was a point um, immediately after September 11th when I know at National Public Radio, we decided to take on a role almost of a calm, reassuring voice in the night, which literally is what I did along with Scott Simon for two weeks after the attack in New York and, and against the Pentagon and in Shanksville. Um, we basically went around the clock, pretty much staffing uh, 24 hours a day with a talk show host and a journalist, and we interviewed people. We talked to sources, we tried to get information to people, uh, sometimes just simple information, when's the power going to be back on, on in lower Manhattan. Um, it, it's looking back on it now, you know, uh, more than a decade later, it, it's still, I can still vividly remember a lot of the things we were dealing with then, just trying to get information out and to, to almost reassure people and tell them, hey, you know, it's going to be okay. Um, it was certainly an, there was certainly an economic component. Obviously, the attack was targeted um, at the heart of the U.S. Financial Center. And interestingly enough, we had another incident just yesterday, which some of you may have heard about, where an individual uh, was apparently trying to target the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Uh, it was an undercover operation, so there was never any actual danger that this would get carried out. And this speaks to the fact that I think there is heightened security and heightened law enforcement out there now post 9-11. And it's not, there are times when you wonder, okay, you know, maybe there are some questionable tactics being used, but maybe not. I mean, this individual may well have carried out an attack. Um, he may not have, but he certainly had the intent. He went and bought supposedly a thousand pounds of fertilizer. He bought a truck. Uh, he had it all, what he thought, wired up to detonators, and the only reason it wasn't was because the FBI informants were actually the people he was working with. But I, I think the economy still is reverberating to some degree all this time later, and then, we, of course, we had a lot of other problems. The last time I was here, four years ago, I spoke extensively about what was going on with the economy in terms of the bursting of the housing bubble, in terms of um, the almost toxic assets that are, that are derivatives. And it's amazing to me four years later that not all that much has changed. The economy is still very, very flat. Um, unemployment, actually, interestingly enough, is almost exactly where it was before the last election. Um, it's virtually unchanged at this point. Uh, there are other things that, are, that have taken a long time in coming. Uh, regulation of securities markets seems to be very slow. 
derivatives are only now getting reined in. These are the things that are very complicated financial instruments that I think Warren Buffett referred to as, you know, weapons of mass dis financial, financial mass destruction. And it's not actually um, hyperbole. I mean, that's really more or less what happened to the economy uh, because of some of these sophisticated investments that people really didn't understand, including often the people that were putting them together. The one other thing that I just want to touch on briefly, and um, I don't know how many of you are journalists or communications majors in the room? So a fair number. You are probably living through one of the most interesting times, I think, in our profession that, uh, certainly in my lifetime, and probably in many lifetimes, there haven't been that many times in journalism and media, I think, when we've been on the crux of something as huge as we are right now. You know, people talk about the Gutenberg Press in 1440, which changed the world. People talk about radio and television, which is, was around before I was born. But these were huge, huge changes. And now we have the internet and what the popular press calls new media, which those of you who are young enough to have used it all your lives, uh, born digitals, don't think so new anymore, which it really isn't. But this, tech, this technological change is probably the biggest thing that's happened in our profession, certainly that I can remember in my lifetime. And it's radically changing the business, it's radically changing the economic model, and it's changing the way we do things. Um, technology, I think, on balance, is a good thing. Um, I think it democratizes the world. Uh, I think I read the other day that I, Facebook now has 500 billion users, I think. That's, um, that's a significant part of the planet's population. And by the way, most of those people are not in the US. And by the way, most of those people use this to access Facebook. Um, that's, that's the future of our industry um, and, in many ways, the economy. I think technology and the economy are inextricably linked together. And I think that all the students in this room are the people that are going to have to grapple with the tough problems about how to integrate technology, how to make it work, how to integrate it into journalism, uh, and how to ultimately make journalism uh, economically viable, how to monetize, to use the jargon, how to monetize content across platforms. And those are the kind of issues that I'm spending a lot of time looking at and thinking about. Um, the convergence of media, the fact that, you know, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with futurists like Clay Shirky and others, he's not really a futurist, but I'll say media analysts, who basically say, argue that when everyone is a publisher, who's a journalist? And it's a good question. Um, these are all the kind of economic issues that I think are really important for our profession. And um, I'll wrap it up on that note, but I think that to, to say that technology and the economy are, are linked is pretty self-evident at this point. Well, I'll start with that question um, first then. Um, you know, it was just announced that Newsweek is going digital after being in print for 80 years. And so when you talk about the economics um, kind of of the journalism and communications profession, um, a lot of issues with newspapers going digital, a lot of issues with television people doing all kinds of other things, even issues with information being distributed so quickly that you kind of can't take it back if it's wrong. So um, can, can you all offer comments um, further on that? Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's a great question, and I, I agree with Jack that I think this is a really exciting time to be thinking about journalism because it's very open to new ideas and new thinking about this. Um, you know, we just had um, uh, one of the leaders of Google's news and social media to our campus about a week ago, and he was saying that, you know, he's not that old of a guy, he's in his late 50s, but he said, well, I can't even think about what might happen in a lot of ways because I'm so, um, have been so immersed and have been a part of sort of old media, traditional media, right? So this idea that I'm gonna innovate outside of this is hard for me because I see things in this, in this sort of way that it's been done for so long. So I do think this is, is a really exciting time. I would say a couple of the trends that I'm seeing, um, particularly with, with the delivery of content, um, 
and one of the things that we're struggling with trying to teach our students, but I, I would encourage people to, to, to get some familiarity with if they don't have it already, is thinking about how conducting research and research methods and how to understand data is now playing into things. Um, because so much more information is now available to us than, used, than there used to be out there, but we don't all know, our journalists aren't always trained, how to analyze and deal with numbers and big data sets and how to even import it into something, how to visualize data, right? We know that a lot of people learn better visually, not everybody, but a lot of people. And so I think one of the challenges is going to be to think about how we are moving towards a data-driven society. And you know, on the one hand, we think of Twitter as 140 characters of less, it's oversimplified everything. But I would argue on the other end of this is what I keep hearing everyone talk about is big data. How do you manage and deal with big data? And, and it's almost like there's there's so much information out there that the journalists who are trained to develop these kinds of skills are going to help the rest of us be informed citizens and sort through things. Um, so I think that's a really important trend to watch. You know, I agree. This is where you get to the aggregation issue. Um, when there's so much stuff coming at you all the time, and all of you guys and, and you know girls who go out and do reporting uh, or get into journalism, whether it be uh, radio, digital, whatever you get into, um, even newspapers, which I still think, by the way, have a future. I know a lot of people don't, but I do. Um, because I, someone has to create that content at the end of the day. And that's basically what Vanessa was saying. If you're not trained to do the content, it doesn't matter what platforms you have. These are just delivery vehicles and ways of packaging information. And the other issue is that why, quote unquote, amateur journalism, I think, you know, this is somebody with a cell phone or, a tw or, or tweeting or, you know, or whatever, using Twitter to communicate. These are all valuable resources, but I don't think they're going to replace journalists who are able to analyze content and who have the knowledge and background to make sense of it. Without that, it doesn't, it's just noise. And, um, I think that's what's really, really going to be important for the media t to get their, their head around. And it, it's difficult because we talked about, I talked about monetizing content and, and making, basically paying for the journalism. That's getting harder and harder to do. There are people that are spending a lot of time looking at ways of doing that because it is so vitally important, I think, to the national discourse. Um, so, Pat, I think this question is a little bit for you and, uh, and Jack. Of course, it's a presidential election year, and um, in the last debate, we did hear the candidates talk a little bit about green jobs and clean energy. They talked about that um, in regards to gas prices and uh, a college student's question about having a job when they graduate. Uh, so can you speak a little bit more on that? Is that really the way to create jobs? Is this an industry where jobs can really be created? And um, is, is that really a good way to kind of kickstart the economy? Good question. Um, two comments. Actually, I'll comment on the last one, too. It's the business guy. You know, uh, entrepreneur um, and what's going on in journalism today and kind of the fact that um, maybe tomorrow you're not associated with NPR or a major channel in, you become kind of your own brand of who you are. And you almost have to have the business skills to understand how do you build your own brand to get your message out there and who you're about and how to do that. And that, um, my advice would be if you're a journalist, take a couple business courses and understand the basics of business and how you be can become your own entrepreneur because as the channels have become so diverse to so many people, there's so many different opportunities to get your message and what you do out there. Excuse me. And, um, uh, and then the second part of that, the green jobs and, and, and the, uh, the activity there. Um, you know, I think um, there was a huge push in green when we started E2E Materials. It was 2007. There were there were billions of dollars flowing into companies. Um, one of the statistics, the uh, National, National Venture Capital Association, that's the group of venture capitalists that invest in new ideas and, and ideas like that, that. They were putting about $30 billion into new companies at that time. And then the economy crashed, and, and, and that retracted down to about $20 billion. And that really wasn't a 33% you know, cut, cut across the top of all of their investments. They retracted away from risky companies or early stage companies that have the inherently higher risk. So I think we've seen um, an impact of that 
Um, this year, that investment is going to crawl back up to about 25 billion. So it's starting to come back, but it's when you're looking at new energy sources and alternative energy sources and companies like E2E, where we're talking about factories that cost money and equipment that costs money and, and building technologies and bringing those forward that cost money, um, they're looking for investments like three guys with uh, that live on pizza and have laptops in their, mm -hmm. in their dorm room that can create the next Twitter and just scale it up with very little money. And so I think we've seen an impact of the retreat of business investment in the area. And, um, uh, and I think that's had an impact on the promise of green jobs, where the government funding that was coming in was coming in alongside a lot of that. And we, we saw a lot of that retreat from those types of companies. Um, but I think that the need for alternative energy still exists. And, it, and you, can, you can impact alternative energy on different, different scales. Um, a company that uh, I'm invested in is a small skateboard company called Comet Skateboards. And I'll give them a plug. Uh, they make great skateboards for, for the skateboarders, but that's not why I'm invested in, in them, the fact that they make good longboards. It's really, uh, there are a bunch of skateboarders who are really passionate about how they build skateboards and regionalizing their materials and taking their own energy future into their own hands. They don't. Uh, all the scraps that come off of the skateboards get reprocessed back into the, into the heating the facility where they make the skateboards. They're using innovative opportunities like Kickstarter uh, to raise funding to put in windmills and a water filtration system so that the water they're using to make their skateboards is reused and, and actually goes back cleaner than what they're getting. So they're, they're really focused on being very efficient in what they're doing and that has an impact as well. And I don't know that those green jobs are actually be, being counted uh, in today's uh, conversations. I, I, I want to say Pat's absolutely right, by the way, about being your own brand. I think a lot of you know that intuitively, but you definitely want to do that within reason. Obviously, if you're working for a big organization like I am, they have some questions sometimes about what you put on your Facebook page. and. You know, you have to be somewhat judicious about how you use social media. But I think social media is obviously one great way to brand yourself as, as a journalist. Um, I think when we talk about this election again, as I said, I feel like I've almost, you know, I'm saying the same things I said four years ago. Um, the economy is still limping along to some degree. Um, things are better, but they're not great. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see um, right now. I mean, we have been focused as the media on this election intensively. By the way, I'll apologize for the coverage a lot of us do. I don't really think it's all that great at times. Um, I think a lot of times we do the horse race analogy way too much. Uh, I think we focus way too much on who won or who lost the debate, um, who's up or down in the polls, um, you know, who had a nice tie on that day and whose hair looks good. Um, I, I mean, really, I think we should focus a lot more on the substantive issues of this race than perhaps we're focusing on. Um, and that being said, you know, I, I say that across the board, including what we do sometimes. I think we try, uh, but I don't know that we all always hit the, hit the home run on it. But I think, um, I think this is where the media really needs to, to sort of do some self-reflection on how we handle coverage and the kind of information that we're imparting, because I think we could do a better job, because I think it's important. I think um, every year there are issues. There are certainly issues in this state about voter ID and other issues that I think are phenomenally uh, crucial for people to get involved in and speak out about. So I, I guess just to sort of wrap this thought up, um, you know, the election is coming, and this is a very, very, very close race. We all know that. And it's going to be very interesting to see. But I think in the final days, it would be nice if maybe a little more time was spent on the issues. Uh, so I, I do want to talk about um, one issue and one point that you kind of brought up, Amy, about uh, journalists and reporters kind of waiting for the government to feed them information. And I want to kind of talk about that in respect to Libya, how um, you know the comment was made that the what happened was over a video protest and everybody's coverage every they interviewed the actors the producer chased them down and then it turned out it wasn't really so 
so do you think that that's a trend that you know, not maybe independently going further because, you know, I know as a journalist, sometimes you hear something, your boss says, what happened, get something on now, and you say, well, that's what they said, and you go with it. But, but do you think that's something new that, that wasn't that way before, maybe when we didn't have 24 hours, the web, and everything else? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a couple of different things happening, and I think even, you know, sort of folded into your last question also gets at this, which is when you think about, I, I agree with Jack. I think good journalism is going to be there, whether it's printed on paper or it's you know through your, your phone. Um, the problem has been, though, as these economic models for journalism are less sustainable, it's the cuts, you know, the people who are producing this content that oftentimes lose their jobs. And the fewer journalists you have, the harder it is for you to, to have widespread coverage. We've seen that happening in global news for a very long time. I think that what you see in American coverage of international news is, is partly so reliant on government and so lacking because we just frankly don't have people in those places to try to, to you know, get information. Now, you can certainly make an argument that in a place like Benghazi that is clearly unstable and not safe, there wouldn't be a lot of folks, right? I mean, same problem with trying to report from Syria right now. Um, and I think that um, as even if you think about the relationship with terrorism, I think it's much more dangerous for a journalist sometimes to cover some of these stories. I mean, we saw that with Daniel Pearl, and there are many other examples, and of course, across history we know there are examples, but I think that, that people who want to take advantage of um, YouTube and other ways to get information out there, you know, can sort of, can do that. So, um, yes, I think that, that the media has partly because it's downsized, right? You're probably doing the job of three people, um, you know, and I think most journalists would tell you that whether they're working in television or uh, radio or um, newspapers or in some, you know, amalgamation on the web. And so I think that downsizing the people who produce content, while this is a time of, of expansion in some ways, we're seeing those traditional jobs sort of, of shift, and I think you're seeing that impact. On the, the flip side, and I know several of you want to go into public relations, I think that public relations has become much more sophisticated in its understanding of how to communicate with journalists. And so less time to tell stories, more professionalization of public relations and other kinds of, of communications um, uh, professions and people who can get information, whether it's governmental or corporate or otherwise, I, and then the speed put all those things together and it's a very difficult environment you know to try to get things right and get it out there and correct the record because I also think um, we have a short attention span you know we're seeing that in this election right I mean some some gaff it's on the news 24 7 for three days and then it's gone and then it's on to the next gaff or the next poll or the next you know thing and if you think about traditional formats or you might only have 60 seconds to tell a story, you know, or you only have a tiny little space. That's one thing technology is better about. It gives us more room on the web to do things, but I think it makes it very difficult for journalists to produce good, thorough, informative pieces, you know, in, in that kind of cycle. It can be done, certainly, so I don't mean to sound like it's not there, but I think it makes it much more difficult. Yeah, I would just say real quickly, too, we saw that um, post-Katrina. This is not a new phenomena. I mean, in the days and hours after Katrina, we had reports of lootings and rapes and robberies and murders and all kinds of things, which later turned out not to be true. Um, it has a lot to do with the speed, uh, as Amy points out. It has a lot to do with something to do with the staffing, but a lot to do with the speed. Uh, a lot to do with the increased use of crowdsourcing, which has become quite, quite popular with some journalists. Um, it, it's a tool like anything else. You, I, you have to use it with a modicum of restraint. Um, I know post uh, Colorado shooting, the movie theater shooting recently, we were watching Twitter. Uh, we weren't reporting what was said on any of those tweets, but we were watching what people were saying, and they were doing. They were sending out messages from that theater, so we were getting a pretty good handle, almost in real time, not quite about what was going on there. So I mean, the speed at which the information is disseminated makes it very challenging for journalists to try to make sense of it and to get it right and to not jump right away. And we've had our own faux pas with that. NPR had made an egregious mistake on that front because we jumped on the Gabrielle Gifford story. And we thought we had people on the ground. We thought we had two sources. Well, guess what? It turned out 
that two sources were actually one source because they were all talking to the same person. And that's what happens. You get into a communications feedback loop where a bunch of people are all talking to one person, but it's going around in a circle and you can't figure it out. And these, this is really challenging for journalists now. And uh, I want to talk a little bit more about um, the business end. Um, you mentioned that journalists and even public relations professionals, you kind of need to brand yourself. And I think you can all speak on that because some journalists may not be able to find a job. I know countless people have graduated and can't find a job. But you can, you know, create a, a website or a YouTube page. And some people have been quite successful in actually uh, producing reputable content, <laughs> which is important, on, on, through those mediums. So can you talk about kind of the, the business of being a journalist, not necessarily for a company or for a big publication, but um, you're kind of a self-independent business? <laughs> uh, well, I can't speak it, of it specifically to journalism, but I think the basics of business is, you know, having a channel for what it is you're doing and, and getting it out there. And, you know, with E2E, with us, it was looking at markets and how do we get out to reach those markets. And we went to the existing manufacturers and said, hey, we can make your products better. We don't have to compete against you to do that. It took a lot of money to do that. So if you think about how do you get your message out there, there's tremendous opportunities to do that, Twitter, Facebook, and, and, and things that will help you do that. But I think leveraging those tools, tools you need to understand, too, what your message is. And uh, we started out E2E by saying, hey, we're going to make green furniture. Isn't that cool? And you know, the more greenwashing there was in the market, the more um, uh, you know, it became a little disingenuous to say, oh, this is green, and then somebody says, no, it's really not. We just backed away from it totally. And we just focused on saying, hey, we're, you know, we're gonna leverage our ethos as a company and make better products that they're just gonna happen to be very green. And um, so we, we, we focused more on the ethos of the company as opposed to the products that the company was making. Um, so thinking about what is your real message and what, how it's gonna resonate with people in the marketplace and how your, what your market is and how you're going to tap into that market. And then the other side of that is how do you fuel that? And there's you know, tremendous things going on with crowdfunding right now. Things like Kickstarter and you can take an idea and really get some fuel behind it and, it, and get it out there and find out whether that idea is going to work. And, and, um, and you know, if it doesn't figure out a way to do it better the next time or, or refine it so that you can do it. So. Um, you know, part of the entrepreneurial process uh, that we always used in E2E was, you know, let's, let's try a lot of things and fail really quick because if they don't <laughs> work, we don't want to spend a lot of time on them. And um, so you can replicate that process and, and just refine it to find something that really does work and find your niche and then figure out how you're going to feel it. Yeah, I, I, I would echo, too, on the, the finding your niche. I really think that more and more, you know, um, I graduated from Edinburgh in 1989, and when I thought about, um, you know, who, who was I reporting for? I mean, what was, what was my audience? What was I trying to do? I thought in geographically bound ways, right? I mean, we talk about geographic markets in television or news. And I think now that, that we know that technology has eliminated a lot of those barriers, it hasn't changed the fact, though, that in some ways you do have to think about what it is you do well what your expertise is and how you then, you know, get branded with that, right? I think the days of, of churning out generalists in journalism, I mean, there's still those jobs out there, but more and more it's about, well, you know, what, what can you provide some expertise for? So that if I want to try to cover what's going on um, in green technology, I have to have some knowledge of green technology. I mean, I have to be able to interview someone like Pat and be able to understand what he's saying to me. I have to know the science behind it. Um, and I think you're seeing more and more specialization within journalism simply because people do have to be flexible and move. And part of your identity is not only that you, you know, can write well, that you um, can sort through information well, but that you really actually have some expertise that you bring to the table because um, you know, as I said earlier, I think the, the increase in information that's out there, you know, you really have to be able to detect when things aren't right or when something just smells a little fishy or, 
when you know that, that there's some piece of information the public or, or however you define your audience needs, but you need to put that in simple language. I think of that with medical and health reporting a lot, but we also see it, I'm sure, in business and economy news. I mean, part of the challenge is to make that clear and easier for people to digest. So I think as you build a brand, you really do have to think about what is it that you have some expertise and knowledge in. And when you're first starting, that can be really hard because you're still sort of learning about things. But I think you have to constantly challenge yourself to develop you know, some, some basis of knowledge so that as you, know, you have a brand, it's attached not only to the quality of your ability to communicate, but that you have knowledge too. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think one of the things I will say that we definitely have at NPR is institutional knowledge. Um, we have no shortage of people who know a great deal about the things they cover. We have science reporters who have PhDs um, in, the science, you know, in their field, in astronomy, whatever. Um, the knowledge is almost a given these days, especially in um, journalism and in, in all fields, public relations, just about anything you go into. You're going to have people who know what they're doing. Business reporters now routinely have MBAs, almost almost to a, a, a T. Everybody I've spoken with recently who's gone into business reporting pretty much has an MBA now. Um, there are exceptions, like myself, when I did it for 10 years, but I did it early on, but now I probably couldn't get in the door. So you really need to have that knowledge uh, right off the bat. But what Pat talked about is something that's actually more important for you guys as students, which is that entrepreneurial spirit and ability to try things, lots of things, and have them fail. So what? If they fail, so what? Try something else. You know, we try things all the time that don't work in media. Establish media. The New York Times tries things all the time that don't, time don't work. Um, you really have to have that ability um, to, to just keep trying things and you'll get some things that'll succeed. Um, Kickstarter is a, is, a, is a funding source that people have talked about. Um, a lot of people I know have used it successfully to start ventures. You could use it to start a journalistic venture. Uh, you can work in Patch and some of these other areas. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Patch, but it's sort of a micro-local reporting website where people basically write about their communities. And there are those kinds of opportunities for you guys who are emerging now with the knowledge of how to use the various platforms, how to use social media, how to use the, all the digital technologies, how to leverage content across a wide variety of platforms. Those entrepreneurial activities are there. And a lot of the people who are in this room or in other rooms like this are going to be the people that come up with the next big media thing, guaranteed. Uh, so I, I want to go back to kind of talking about, um, I guess, the, the big political issues, because we are, of course, in election year. And that's a lot of what's been talked about. And you all have expertise in some of the, the big issues that we've been seeing, the economy, of course, with the national debt, terrorism, and, and green jobs, and clean energy, gas prices, all of that, all kind of lumped into one. Um, so can you all speak on that in, in just a way that, that people can understand it? Because sometimes these can be complicated issues. And as journalists, I know a lot of times you're trying to cram a story about the national debt, at least in my medium, into 30 seconds. And that's very hard to do sometimes. So can you all talk a little bit more, more about those issues, since we have your expertise right here? I'll start. First, you know, as I said earlier, the economy is probably center stage in this election in many ways. Uh, you know, you've heard it over and over and over, but it really is the economy. Uh, that's what people care about. People tend to vote their pocketbook. Uh, people tend to vote whether they're working or not working. You know, there's the old saying, when um, your neighbor loses his job, it's a recession. When you lose your job, it's a depression. Um, it really is a personal pocketbook issue in many cases. But there are also big issues for the country going forward, and those need to be weighed as well. I think people need to consider those issues. You know, we're still winding down from two extremely expensive wars, uh, which certainly have um, run up the national debt, as Vanessa mentioned. Um, there are a lot of other issues that will affect people going out well into the future economic issues in terms of tax structures and how we define benefits and what people can 
write off and not write off. I mean, there's a lot of complicated moving parts in this election. So I would say, just to sum it up, I think that what you need to do as a voter is try to become as informed as you can on the issues that resonate with you. Because ultimately, that's how you should be making your decisions. An informed electorate is exactly that, an informed electorate. And frankly, I think if you just rely on the media to give you that context, you may not get it. I think some of that you should get on your own and actually really look into the things that, that you're passionate about. And I think that's really what's important in this election. Two, two quick thoughts on that. Um, and, and I guess they're not that quick. I know it's <laughs> complex issues. Um, but the, the thought that uh, the economy is not moving forward because there's a Democratic president in really doesn't make a lot of sense because most of the business that I'm involved in is pretty apolitical. It's about making money. And making money and putting money and investing in an economy is, is, is a function of risk. And we had such a, a dramatic shift in the foundation of our financial system that just introduced such an element of risk. And the only way that risk is going to go away, I mean, you can say that the the work that they were doing to restructure the system and put the controls in place may, may not have been the most perfect way of going about it, but reduction of risk just is going to take time as things stabilize and, and the risk profile goes away. Uh, the risk profile comes down and more money can go into the economy and, and people can feel comfortable investing in the economy to help grow that. Um, that was one thought I had, and one more specific to E2E on the, uh, on the, uh, on the political side. Um, uh, I mentioned formaldehyde in my comments, and, and formaldehyde has been uh, uh, is a product that's in many wood products today, and it was identified as a, as a carcinogen in 2004, uh, and um, many other nations, Japan, Europe, have, have put in legislation minimizing the use or, or, or eliminating the use of formaldehyde in these types of products. Um, that was a, a great impetus to E2E, because we could go and say, look, this legislation is coming. It actually came into California in 2007, and the Senate adopt, adopted the California legislation in 2010. And that stands to really change that whole industry. And, and E2E uh, stood to benefit from that, uh, but not dramatically. It was just more of something that would accelerate us into the market as, as uh, the people were looking for new solutions that didn't have formaldehyde in them. And, um, you know, I guess the political side of that is that the EPA is the organization that would carry that legislation forward. So depending on where the legislation, where the election goes, um, the EPA is one of those uh, organizations that's on the uh, chopping block. So that's an example about how some of those organizations that, uh, um, you know, depending on where you stand, can help uh, some new ideas and some new innovative ideas get into the marketplace and do things uh, a little differently than we do today. Um, yeah, I would also say that as you think about getting more information and becoming more informed, because I, I, I agree, I mean, we know the media is limited in what, what it can do. Um, I think that we, one of the things I am curious about and I'm starting to think about working on a study about is I feel like we're in a climate now where facts are negotiable. <laughs> you'll hear one person give one fact, you'll hear another person give another fact, and how they present and frame that fact can have very different implications and could swing you one way or the other and how you how you think that information um, should be. So I think one of the things that that would be very helpful and I and I really do wish we had a little more of this um, in journalism is to speak in straightforward terms, right? To quit making up names for things and calling things what they, you know, what sounds better, right? I mean um, we talk a lot about taxes and what's a tax cut. Well, when you start to look into what is a tax cut and is it a loophole and is it a is it a raise in taxes? Is it a and there's so much out there that gets put out in these sort of general talking points that campaigns put forward that I think um, it is really difficult sometimes to sort through that information. So uh, journalists have to help with that process. But I, I think it's important to also try to look around and find um, other avenues to talk through different things, whether it's um, you know nonprofit kinds of sites that are doing some kinds of fact checking or information gathering, and to remember that if something doesn't make sense to you, to, to try to sort of um, 
go back to thinking about what it might be in its simplest parts. I just think we've gotten to a point where we use language in a way that is not really language. I think of one of the essays I have one of my classes read is uh, George Orwell and uh, you know, on the English language. It's a classic essay of his which talks about writing simply, writing in straightforward terms. Because so much of, I think, what's going on is, is trying to mold opinion that we sometimes lose sight of the facts. Um, it, I, I think of the birther conversation as an example of that, but there are examples on other, you know, on both sides. But, you know, when, when you have the presentation of a, of a certifiable birth certificate and you have, you know, some discussion about whether or not that's real, we've come into a climate where facts are becoming much more negotiable. And I don't think that that should really be the case. I think we have to find ways to cut through the, the BS on both sides and try to really focus on, on what's at stake. And I think it's increasingly hard to do that because campaigns are more and more sophisticated at spinning and, and framing and, and maybe even saying things that are factually correct but presented in one way, they look one way, and presented in another way, they look another way. So I think journalists really have to work hard to try to get, get block out that noise and, and cut through it. Absolutely. I think in every story, just very quickly before I get to the next question, the what sounds better um, always wins in a newsroom, at least in, in the TV newsrooms that I've been in. And even with the case of um, the Marjorie Deal Armstrong case, which was uh, televised heavily here, um, it, it became dubbed the pizza bomber case, but no pizza was bombed and no pizza shop was actually. And it's one of those things where it sounded okay and it was quick and that's what it became known as. So if you listen to those things, sometimes you'll come to realize that sometimes they don't really make sense. So uh, so my next question um, is for you, um, Pat, and maybe Jack, you can chime in a little bit too. A lot of times when we think of green, sometimes we think of more expensive. So, so how do you kind of leap over that hurdle being um, a greener company? Because a lot of times that's what people think. Sure, it's, um, you know, that, that got put into the marketplace. I, I, use an example other than E2, there was a company on the west coast that uh, developed a new drywall product for building that was had a lot lower energy uh, usage than it. It was, it was dramatically, and it was a better product. And uh, they were introducing that into the market around 2007 and 2008. And the simple fact is when you're going up into like a building product like that, you have a company like U.S. Gypsum, which makes billions and billions and billions of square feet of drywall every year. They're able to take their overhead cost and spread that out very thinly over all that product. And uh, so that gives them the cost competitiveness that um, a, a new company that doesn't have that volume in the marketplace can absorb that cost into. So their, their nominal, their, while their cost as a company may be a little bit lower, the overhead cost of what it takes to run a company, and if you're a new product company, a new development company, um, you've got R&D, you've got scientists, you've got um, you know, that overhead cost that you layer over top of these new technologies. It's, it's something that maybe in the future will be lower cost than what is out there today. But to get it off of the ground, you start to see it be a little higher price. And um, you know that's kind of the facts of, or the realities of, of getting a technology out uh, in that way. Because you, uh, but the other side of that is, as I mentioned earlier, we also saw a lot of greenwashing uh, out there. We saw products getting certifications that, you know, when we looked at the product, we're like, oh, that's a horrible <laughs> product that's made with nasty stuff, and I would never want that. But um, they were able to put a green label on it and up the price and take advantage of that and um, you know that's a dynamic that people will take advantage of in the marketplace for a period of time and over time that's going to settle down and go away uh, as i mentioned for us we don't even talk about the products being green we talk about the products being stronger lighter better and equally as cost effective yeah i would agree with pat i mean there's a time horizon factor there um, there's a reason that sometimes eco, green, whatever label you want to put on them, products are seen as more expensive because often in their uh, initial ramp ups they are more expensive. Uh, a good example that everybody can get their heads around I think is the Toyota Prius. When the Toyota Prius came out I know they were losing money on every car they built. Um, now I don't think they are. Uh, GM is still losing probably money on every Volt it builds. Eventually they may not be. It, it has a lot to do with adoption. It's a longer timeline um, in terms of what people are willing to wait for and 
uh, to look at. Obviously, the legacy, quote unquote, energy sources, oil, coal, natural gas, uh, things that you know, obviously are key in this state, certainly natural gas, um, are cheaper. Uh, but will they be cheaper 25, 50 years from now? Maybe not. And there are other costs that have to be weighed in terms of the environment, in terms of remediation that might have to be done to take care of things, uh, problems that arise from certain things. I think if you take a longer view on many of the um, so-called green energy um, areas, I think that they come out a lot better than if you just look at them in the, in the short term, which I think is really what you were saying, Pat. Uh, so for all of you, uh, what are the... The, the topics, the stories um, in each of your, your areas of expertise that you feel aren't really being told by, by journalists or public relations specialists or just you know people who are getting information to the public in general. What are the issues or stories that you feel like are not getting attention? Um, I guess I can take that one. I think it, it's there are a lot of complicated issues that don't, the media doesn't do well. I think we've pretty much established that. Um, even politics, I don't personally think the media does all that well. I think we do as good a job as we can. I think the New York Times does a pretty good job. I think a lot of uh, more established media outlets with the manpower to do the truth squatting do fairly well, but I don't think as a, as a whole the media does an exceptional job on, on political coverage. I think we could do better. Sometimes economics we don't do as well on because there are often very complicated issues that people don't understand and we tend to either gloss over them or oversimplify them um, in order to make them more accessible and sometimes we dilute them to the point where they're almost meaningless. Uh, I think we do a lot better job of economic coverage than we used to, by the way, but I still don't think that it's great. But you know, I, I think the media is limited. When I say media, too, I talk more about quote unquote legacy media, I guess, which is what I'm familiar with uh, radio, television, newspaper. Because we have finite space, this is really where the web, and I think Amy alluded to this, there is theoretically an infinite amount of space on the, on the web. So, yeah, we spend a lot of time watching cats pay, play the piano, but, you know, we could be filling that with something else. Uh, there's a lot of space that people could use to delve into stories uh, in a lot more depth than we do. And, and this is sort of why I'm really optimistic, I think, about journalism as a profession. Uh, it's, there's, there's always a point where everything looks dismal and horrible and everybody's, oh, this is the end and newspapers are dead and no one's going to pay for news anymore and all these other things. And actually, that's really when people start to get creative and look at ideas, um, you know, I guess nothing focuses the mind like the prospect of a hanging. I mean, but it, it's true. I mean, I think people really are looking at a lot of these different forms and formats and, and coming up with sort of new platforms and new ways of doing things. And I, as I say, there's an infinite amount of space, theoretically, on the internet with which to fill with vital information and things that people could, could, could really be benefited by. And I think that's ultimately what I would like to see. I agree with that. I, I would also add that I think so much of what we do is cyclical. Again, coming back to this, the legacy media idea, particularly, you know. So now we're covering, you know, the economy is issue number one. So we're getting a lot of coverage on the economy. Um, we talk about, um, uh, you know, war and terrorism and things when they sort of come up. But you know, there are a lot of other important things going on that don't get attention unless some thing happens to trigger it as a sort of current thing. So, I mean, I think one area that gets neglected in coverage as a general rule is education. Not just higher education, but K through 12 education. When I have tried to, as a parent, find good information about schools for my child, I have a very difficult time doing that using, you know, traditional media. Um, I think sometimes we just sort of get into routines that, that sort of it's driven by what is the sort of hot current thing and that there are some niche markets like technology I think is one. I think if you want to know what's going on in technology you may not get that all the time on your local television news station. There's so many different outlets where you can get good technology news that's there. Um, there may be some, I mean the Chronicle of Higher Education is wonderful for higher ed, but I think education is an overlooked area and I think we still sometimes still veer too much towards you know, car accidents and crime and, you know, if it 
bleeds, it leads kind of thinking. I think we're better than we used to be, but I still think we're a little too dominated by event focused, you know, whoa, that sort of stuff that makes you stop. And it's not that there isn't room for that, but if you have limited space in those traditional formats, it's taking up space that probably could be better spent. Anything like that, Pat? Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. And I, I, you know, the analogy of um, boiling a frog comes to mind. That um, you know, the, if you throw a frog in boiling water, it's going to jump right out. But if you slowly heat it up, it's, uh, it's that's the way to get it uh, to stay in there. And I think from the things that we see uh, and look at them, sometimes make us scratch our head, are, are things that just become more commonplace um, and really aren't necessarily seen as being very newsworthy. Um, uh, one of the things that just strikes me is the, the number of synthetic chemicals that have been introduced since the 1950s into our products and in our daily lives, and the, the thousands of synthetic chemicals that are used, and the very small percentage of those chemicals that have ever been thoroughly tested for its impact on humanity and what it does to humans. And of those that have been tested, the high percentage of those that have shown that have a negative, like BPA, uh, that was going into many of the plastic baby bottles and the impact that had on uh, breast milk and things like that and issues like um, uh, repro reproductivity of males uh, across the globe is down by 50 percent that's just crazy um, and uh, you know mutant frogs everywhere and you know things like that but um, uh, tying those into some of the things that have been happening and, and uh, uh, it just sometimes seems that there's a uh, there's some missed opportunity there to tell the whole story. Very good. I, I want to get back to um, to our new new media, I guess, and uh, and just kind of ask you all um, personally, how have you embraced new media, social media, uh, in what ways do you use it? What tips would you have for for our audience? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, obviously, uh, those of us who are in the profession have heavily embraced quote unquote new media, which as I pointed out, I think is not really new anymore. Um, Twitter, Facebook, um, Patch, all these other various media sources, you know, many people in this room have been using computers since as long as they can remember. So this stuff is not new anymore, folks. It's here. It's in everybody's lives. Everybody uses it. Everybody's on the internet. Everybody has tablets or soon probably will. Everybody has mobile phones. Uh, and all over the world, people have mobile phones. And they can shoot video. When you had the London bombing, I don't know how many people remember the London bombing, the initial video and photographs that came out of that bombing were mostly by citizens, since there were no journalists there, um, because the journalists couldn't get in because they had had a bomb. You know, they, they were keeping them back. So th this is really already here. The, the, the new media, quote unquote, uh, different digital forms are, are with us. Uh, what we're trying to do now at NPR, and we're spending a lot of time on it, is try to figure out if we were going to reinvent ourselves now with what we know now, 30 some years later after we were formed, would we do things the same way that we do them now? And it's a great, it's a great question. It's a good thought exercise. Would, would we still do everything that we do, maybe you know, from education on up, the same way that we've been doing it? Why? You know, we could change this, we could change that. Uh, the speed, uh, the, the lack of, of, of economic barriers. There are essentially no economic barriers anymore to journalism. And that's actually one of the biggest questions, and I'm spending a huge amount of time looking at this, and actually it's what I'm doing master's work on now, is trying to figure out how you deal with that environment when there are no economic barriers and the barriers to entry are, are essentially blown away, it blows up your model. And that's happened. That's, that's already, that horse is already out of the barn. There's not a whole lot we can do about that. So what we need to do is spend a lot of our time as journalists trying to focus on how we can use the technologies. And at the end of the day, the one thing that, as I said, separates journalists from, I'll say, amateurs or amateur journalists. It's that we understand the, the content that we're dealing with. We have the ability to put it into context that maybe someone out there doesn't. And that's, at the end of the day, what's really, what really differentiates a journalist, I think, from, from 
non-journalists. Um, and, and I think that's what we have to focus on and also figure out a way to keep journalism alive. There are a lot of organizations out there that are looking at this. ProPublica is one. They're a not-for-profit journalistic organization. Some of you are probably familiar with them. Um, they're looking at different models. Um, again, we talked about Kickstarter. That is a model for somebody who wanted to start their own form of journalism. Uh, you have crowdsourcing. You have aggregation. You have a lot of things going on out there, but, I mean, it's, we're, we're in the new media age now, so this is really where we need to be focusing our attention on. Um, the uh, E2V really doesn't leverage a lot of new media because we're, we're changing an existing industry through the existing partners out there. We do some of it, but really um, Comet Skateboards, the company that I mentioned earlier that I'm involved with, really does some unique things around media and reaching out to its audience. And um, one of those was around product design. Uh, so two years ago, three years ago now, I think it was, they. Uh, Jason, who runs that company, and I were talking, and he said, you know, it's, it's, you come up with a new board, you come up with a new shape and design, and, and you put it out there, but you really don't know if it's going to work, you don't know if, where it's going to be and where it's going to go. He said, boy, if there was some way that, you know, all of our customers could tell us exactly what they needed or wanted out of a board, and we can make that, rather than investing all of this in a new board. And out of that conversation came something the, called the, the Comet Test Pilot Program. And, um, Basically, they had a number of people sign up by the board ahead of time, and they got a prototype, and the condition was we gave them a prototype, and they were able to test it and evaluate it, but they had to do it all in an online forum. And um, so the whole design became community-based, which was um, actually covered by International Design Magazine as one of the a unique product development effort you know, ever uh, by letting the community have the prototypes and talk about the changes that could be done and the improvement that, that can be made. Um, from a business perspective, that became very cool. Um, one, because the money that was raised from the people paying to be test pilots was used to pay for the tooling, so there wasn't really an investment by the company to do that. And secondly, it generated so much buzz online in the skateboard community that uh, he pre-sold before he even you know, shipped the first board. We had hundreds of those sold already. Um, but that was a way that you know, I thought was really creative of the team there to, to take a look at something and ask the question and say, well, you know, we're not bound by the way products have been developed in the past. Let's use this channel to the market. Let's use this, these, these customer contacts that we have and, and the Facebook presence and, you know, and, and all of that. And the, the second thing they do that I think is really unique is, is leveraging video content. Um, uh, video media has been you know, relatively easy to make. Um, we can get guys, our, Comet makes long boards, and the, the guys that do downhill long boarding, they do like 60 million, 60 mile an hour passes down mountain roads, and it's just actually like the closest thing to flying uh, while you're still on the ground. It's really some beautiful stuff, but they, they started putting videos out, and it, that fail quick idea, they put the video out, and they would see what was going on, and then they realized that if they spent a little time on the video showing how some of it is done and 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 the why it helped people looking for boards and looking to do longboarding and, and enjoying that style of skating, how to do it and and to and to oh that's how that trick is done. You reach down here and you know, I'm not a skateboarder by any means, but uh, uh, leveraging that that media channel and feedback channel to continually improve is an example. Um, yeah, I mean, it, one of the things that's been interesting, I think, for me, because, you know, I'm, I'm not working as a journalist anymore, but I teach a lot of, of classes in, in this, and, um, and I think about, uh, even in higher education, you know, I always bristle when we talk about branding or school or branding when I don't, you know, I don't think of education in the branding realm, but we all have to now, uh, just like everybody else does. But I, so I think if you think about how people are using um, the media, I guess the, the only thing I would add to, to what Jack and Pat have said is that I think it's important to, and I think you both had said earlier about not being afraid to make mistakes, I think we have to get comfortable with trying all these new things even if we wouldn't use them ourselves. So, you know, um, if I have a lot of, uh, of my students who don't like or don't want to use Twitter. Eh, you know, you kind of need to figure it out and at least be, you know, able to talk about it and understand what it does even if you don't want to use it personally. And I think as we see more and more things, I mean, think about how quickly things are changing. 
You know, I mean, think of how, you know, I, I, when I was here in school, we didn't have cell phones. It's hard for me to even believe there was a time when we all didn't have cell phones. So I think technology, however we're using it, both personally and professionally, it's going to continue to change and evolve. And one of the challenges is to not be afraid of that and to, to try new things, even if it doesn't fit maybe what you would know it to do, because you don't necessarily know what it is to begin with. So, um, so I think that as you think about the different ways that you might apply it to your life, you also have to be open to the fact that other people may use it differently and you just have to constantly be aware of what's going on. Um, and I'll add to that that I think collaborative work is becoming more and more important. You know, we think of that in the academy. Um, but I think it can even be true in, in journalism with technology. If you don't understand a technology and it scares you, well, talk to one of your friends who is very technologically well-versed um, so that they can, can teach you things and show you things. Um, but don't be afraid to try new, new things as they emerge, even if they don't stick around. <laughs> sure. I want, do we have a timekeeper? I want to make sure I'm okay on time. Sure, I didn't want to run over our audience question time. <laughs> okay, you can take mine. Uh, allow some opportunity for audience interaction. So Jess is going to come out. If you have a question, just call her over uh, and she'll... Uh, introduce you and ask your question and then I just want you to stick around for a few more minutes because our students will have a presentation for our panelists before they go. So any questions just call Jess back. You know, actually, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question because uh, that they've been around a while. It's, it's one of those things like uh, tobacco, you know, their lobby is really strong and they've been around for hundreds of years. But um, actually, I have uh, on the board of E2E a former executive out of Georgia Pacific and, and you know, we think about that all the time and, and it was really... Um, the, the opportunity we see is not necessarily to take away business from the timber in, industry, but establish the business model and grow with the populist demand around uh, different products. So we see that there's you know, the global population that I mentioned earlier, that there's really room for both the existing timber industry and, and E2E in, in the future. And it doesn't have to be a contentious this or that, it's just the uh, um, starting with the, the products that the wood industry doesn't think a lot of, like particle board and medium density fiber board, those are really inexpensive uh, wood products uh, comparatively to like a Georgia Pacific who's making you know, two by fours and, and other higher end you know, structures. So starting at the low end of the scale for them, for us that's really meaningful and it's really not that painful to them and hopefully that'll be like the uh, boiling frog analogy that I used earlier. <laughs> Hi, my name is Deke, and um, I, have a, I have a question for the uh, journalists over here. Um, since you do tell us, you know, that it's very important to be informed and vote and stuff, and um, with journalism, um, well, I don't know if you're, oh, well, the th I'm trying to think of, like, with the voting thing with, within your organization, since I'm sure you are registered to vote, and you do get to decide, you probably do vote for either candidate, does that go into how you report the news? Like you hear a lot about biases within the news organizations. So I'm just wondering your opinion on that. All right, I'll jump into that. I mean, I guess every person has their own uh, biases. You, you can't be an individual without biases. The job of a journalist, however, is basically to ignore those biases and report fairly, accurately, succinctly, and inclusively about what's happening 
if, it, if it's in a political race, if it's at your city council level, whatever level it is. I mean, you know, I covered city council when I was in Erie for a while. I didn't think every city council person was the greatest thing since sliced bread, but, you know, I did not work that into my biases. I covered them based on what they did and what their agenda was and what issues they were talking about. Um, as a journalist, you really have to do that. I mean, that's what your job is. Cer certainly people have their own biases. Certainly, as journalists, we're not precluded from voting, though I do know actually there are journalists who don't vote. Um, I think there's a guy at the Washington Post who does not vote because he claims, and this is his argument, and I think it's somewhat extreme, that no one can be unbiased and therefore as a journalist you should not vote at all and that way there's no even appearance of a conflict of interest. I, I wouldn't go that far. I think most rational people can put aside um, whatever their prejudices are, whatever their personal biases are, whatever their political affiliations are, and cover the issues fairly. That's my take on that. Follow up. I have a follow up question for that too. Is, um, what What's the organization's in, um, take on their reporters voting? You mean my organization? Um, just any. Really. Well, I mean, we certainly are allowed to vote. Um, I, I will tell you some things we're not allowed to do. We're not allowed to take part in either pro-life or, um, uh, ab you know, uh, abortion rights marches. We're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to put political signs on our front lawns. We're uh, discouraged from putting bumper stickers on our cars. But uh, we're certainly allowed to exercise our right to vote. Hi, I'm Ken Close. Uh, I drove in from out of town, so I listened to a little talk radio on the way today. One of the topics today was the debate, and should a moderator inter fact check from the moderator table? Uh, that's open to the whole group. Uh, I think um, my sense, I, I assume this was referring specifically to the Libya exchange the other night. Um, I think generally speaking, the, moderator, the moderator's role in those debates is to keep things moving along and to keep, 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 keep people going and, and on point. So I think in the context of the debate the other night, that correction didn't bother me because you could almost argue that you could interrupt both sides all the time, right? At any time saying, well, but you're framing it this way, but it could be that, it could be that. So in the context of that one specific instance, since it was hanging them up, and the fact-checking sort of said they were both right. It didn't personally bother me. I don't, I don't think a journalist can ever, um, I, I think it's always appropriate for a journalist to try to make some effort to put out fact-based information. So it didn't, it didn't bother me what happened the other night. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think a moderator's job is to moderate. I mean, simply put, uh, they're, they're really not going to have the time to do the kind of in-depth fact-checking that you need to do in a debate when the facts are often tenuous, I'll to put a kind of turn phrase on it. Um, so I think what their job is to, to do is to make sure the candidates get equal time to express their views. I think the responsibility of the media is to later, uh, either immediately after the debate, which we try to do, and definitely the next morning, which we also try to do, to do fact-checking, to have our, you know, we have all of our reporters who are experts in economics, uh, who are experts in uh, law, who are experts in environment, who are experts on all the things the candidates are talking about, the next day weigh in and we'll, you know, they'll be asked by Morning Edition host or whoever, okay, this particular claim was made by the candidate. Is this true, not true, partially true? And those, that you can answer the questions one of those three ways for every single one of them. And I think that's a valuable service that journalists can do. I really don't have any thoughts. <laughs> um, my name's Erica, and it's kind of relevant to both the questions that were asked, um, specifically about Mitt Romney. Do you think that his constantly switching in between two different positions on his political campaign about important issues like pro-life or pro-choice or even his system for distributing money between 
eco-friendly technologies. Do you think that makes it kind of harder to do your job as a journalist? <laughs> um, you know, these are the issues you as a voter have to decide. As a journalist, I can't tell you how to vote. I can't tell you whether you should believe one candidate over another. I would tell you that you should listen to what they say, you should check what they say, you should think about what they say, and you should ultimately try to prove or disprove what they say to the best of your abilities. But as a journalist, as somebody who's with an established media organization, you know, I can't answer that question. Go ahead. Um, I would say as, as a TV news, local TV news journalist, uh, which where most reporters are general assignment, you have to kind of know a little bit of a law. I think they say you're a jack of all trades, master of none. You kind of have to know a little bit about everything. And so you can get into a little bit of trouble if you're trying to analyze those things, if you're not really an expert. So for me, for my job, I will tell you exactly what happened. So it's not too difficult for me because I'm not trying to do any kind of analysis. I'm saying this is you know, we'll have maybe like a sound clip. This is what Mitt Romney said on this day. Then this happened, and he said this on this day. I'm Vanessa Herring, back to you. That's pretty much it. Be because when you try to do analysis and you're not really an expert, then that's where you can get into some trouble with bias and your opinion. And so as a general assignment, like local news, it's strictly just what happened. Yeah, I would agree with that. At the national level, we're going to go a little bit beyond that but we're not going to go truth squatting an individual candidate uh, at the expense uh, of that particular candidate and say, oh, well, you know, everything the other guy says is true. I mean, there's a certain amount of fairness, balance, and equity that as a journalist or as the media, you need to have about a political campaign. I mean, the fact of the matter is that much as it, you know, nice as it would be if someone could tell you who to vote for, all we can tell you is basically, here's what the candidates are saying. We can fact check uh, what they said that particular event, but uh, historically, we're probably not going to go back and paint you a roadmap. Now, that's not to say there's not a roadmap for you to find if you want to look for it yourself. You know, other we fact check every debate. So if you really wanted to, you could go back and say, well, they fact checked this debate, and then the second debate, and the third debate, and this many were true, this many were fudge this many were false. You could do it that way. But it's probably not something that the media is necessarily going to do because there is that inherent um, uh, hurdle of bias, I suppose, is the way to put it. I would say it makes John Stewart's job a lot easier. It does. And, and, and arguably, right. and arguably and, and, more entertaining. And John Stewart is great at what he does. He's a satirist, though, okay? This is the thing. I, I mean, I know there are a lot of people friends of mine included, who get their news from John Stewart. But John Stewart's not a news guy. He's a satirist. He's like in the tradition of Mark Twain and to some extent Tina Fey. Uh, he's skewering modern society. That's what he's doing. He does it quite well. Uh, um, I guess the only thing I would add to that is uh, it seems like more and more as information becomes more readily available, as we fact check and we see things, it almost seems like we want, and I see this taking a, a into another area, but in sports a lot. It's all about what will happen, right? Like this idea that we somehow need to predict the future before we can act on something. Oh, well, I, I'm a huge Colts fan and I love Peyton Manning. Will Peyton Manning ever play football again, right? I mean, so so much of sometimes what we get wrapped up in when we, when we sort of move to that next step is trying to figure out and predict the future. All we can do is what everyone has already said, which is try to get the information we have, um, make you know your most recent decision, and you know, watch things as they unfold because you just don't always know what people are going to do um, in, in a future forward-looking kind of way. It's hard to, hard to discern. Okay. My name is Tyler and uh, I wanted to address the idea of bias which most of these questions have centered around. Um, do you think there is a place in this new uh, age of information for bias? Do you think as far as you guys addressed branding and uh, presentation of your information, do you think bias is a utility in media and it can be used as such? If it's your job, 
to be biased. Like if you're Ann Coulter, you know, like if, if you're somebody who that's your job, yes. If you're somebody who works for an organization where you're supposed to be fair and balanced, you won't have a job. So you kind of have to have, what do you want to do? If you want to work somewhere where, or work you know, independently where that's what you do and you, you know, present yourself as someone who is pro whatever you're pro, then that's okay. But you can't be in an organization that's um, just covering the issues and be biased, if that makes sense. Well, I mean, there's bias material all over the web. I mean, you don't have to search very far to find somebody who will reflect whatever bias it is that you believe in. I mean, it's certainly there. Uh, I don't think anybody's information or bias is being restrained out there. Um, you know, Matt Drudge is an example of somebody who very early on, Matt Drudge, by the way, worked at the CBS gift shop. A lot of you probably don't know that. And he started his website early on and basically wrote about gossip he overheard that went out to a very select small group of Hollywood people, just basically Hollywood shop talk. Uh, he did break the Monica Lewinsky story and the rest is history. But, you know, he certainly is somebody who is not unbiased, I, I, I don't imagine, uh, in a, much of what he did. I wouldn't call him a journalist. Um, so you, I think there's there's a lot of bias out there if that's what you're looking for. Uh, if you're looking for something else, that's out there too. I, think. I don't know if that answers your question, by the way. Yeah, but, but I don't know that bias in and of itself is sorry. a valuable tool for journalists, if that's what you're asking. Well, I mean, it's already out there. So, I mean, when you say as a tool, what do you mean? I mean, do you mean to advance a certain agenda? I mean, you can do that without being a member of the media. In fact, I don't know that the members of the media should necessarily be advancing a certain agenda. I mean, as I say, there's plenty of agenda-driven content. Uh, why does, I guess my question to you is, why do you feel that that's something that quote-unquote established media needs to do? Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Oh, sure, people do it all the time. I don't know that that's journalism, however, but you can do it. Um, you know, I heard Pat talk about um, skateboards, it would be great where, the, you know, the, the, the guy from the company said it'd be great if we knew what people wanted. Well, you know, before we had uh, the internet and everything else, people told you what you wanted. That's what marketers did. That was their job. Um, now that you have a democratization of information, anybody who wants to put information out there can do it. However, I think that, I don't know that it's a tool that necessarily is necessary for established media to have. I see your point. Um, but I don't necessarily know what you mean in terms of an opportunity. Of course there's an opportunity to be a satirist. That's what, that's what uh, John Stewart does. That's what Colbert d does. That's what they do. So obviously there's an opportunity to do that. Um, you know, you can argue whether they have a bias, whether they have an agenda. But it doesn't matter because they're not quote unquote journalists. They may be sources of information, but they're not journalists. Now, I know there are people who disagree with me on that, but I, I really don't think they are.
Yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly that can be. I think the other thing that um, I know at least a lot of my friends who um, have wrestled with some of this online with dialogue is that unfortunately a lot of it has um, devolved in ways that also <laughs> don't turn into you know the kinds of good debate that I think you're talking about and sometimes just gets into name calling and you know in civil kinds of, of discourse. But I agree with you, I think there's room for that and I think that there are different mechanisms online for that. Blogs are one. I've actually even seen very thoughtful Facebook exchanges on on varying ideas where one poster is saying something um, sometimes even almost intentionally inflammatory and so yeah I, I, I don't disagree with that. I think you're getting dialogue on sites like the New York Times blogs. I think you get dialogue on our sites but I will tell you in both cases they are filtered. Okay. People are not going to get on there and start throwing bombs and ranting about this or that and get their opinion on the New York Times blog. It's not going to happen. Right? And that's fine. But who determines whether that ha I mean, how do you know what's accountable and what's not? And that's part of what we try to do. And I think, and I, I think we do a fairly good job at it. And, but we're not putting across a bias, I don't think, by doing that. I think you're just, as you say, we're, we're facilitating a hopefully civil debate. Sure, it's opinion. It's opinion, but it's not our opinion. It's the opinion of readers, for the most part. Most of the blogs, when you talk about blogs, we may have a blog out there, but it's, and it may border on opinion, but most of the responses from the, from audience members, from readers, from listeners, whatever, are their opinions in many cases. That doesn't mean there are opinions, that means they're their opinions. As long as they're civil, I don't think there's any problem with facilitating that. I think um, when you, I think when you, um, when you hear sometimes those discussions, um, you know, I had a Facebook page for, for work and, you know, I'll post whatever story I'm working on. Sometimes you get a whole conversation and for me, it, you know, I would just be reporting the facts, but sometimes people bring up issues that maybe you never even thought about. So that, for me, has been a useful tool as a journalist. Even though sometimes the comments are a little bit crazy, if you can sort through the crazy and find the idea <laughs> that's behind it, I think that it can be a useful tool, at least for me, it has enhanced my reporting, hearing things that maybe you didn't think about because someone else has a different life experience or, or you know, is maybe closer to the story or further away from the story. And I think hearing those comments from viewers and readers um, can really help enhance your, your writing. You, of course, have to go check it and make sure that you're reporting what's accurate, but it can maybe have, have you look at some other avenues. Let's have one more question in the back, and then we'll say our thank yous. Um, this is the first part is for Jack. When Governor Romney made his pronouncement very public two weeks ago that Big Bird and probably Jack Spear and Margaret Warner weren't going <laughs> to get any more money, I wondered what the reaction was in the NPR and uh, PBS offices. And the second part for Jack and, and my former student Amy, what do you think about the marriage of government and news, or marriage defined as funding support of, of news? Um, I think my response to Big Bird finally was enough Big Bird, you know, um, but I did at one point send out a Twitter message that said, Big Bird is scared and he's hiding in my basement. Um, you know, these are the kind of issues that come up in elections. I, I don't think we all went, oh no, you know, I think we just looked at it as another issue. We've had our share of uh, political, being used like a political football up on Capitol Hill for quite a while now, so we're pretty used to it at NPR and in public media. We get kicked around a fair amount, so, you know, it was just kind of one more thing. Um, in terms of government funding of media, this is a, a kind of a popular topic and it's thrown out there a lot. Um, I think the figure that I saw, this was reported in the New York Times or the, the uh, Washington Post, the public broadcasting, PBS's share of the federal budget is one one hundredth of one percent. That's not very much money. Um, and that goes to, I think, public radio and television. Um, I don't think that we have a, we get less than one percent of our budget at NPR directly from the federal government, around one percent, maybe a little less. 
Um, some member stations get more. I don't think there's a huge amount of government funding involved in public media. Most of the funding for public media comes from listeners and a fair amount from what we call corporate underwriting, which you would call commercials. Um, and that's where most of our money comes from. So, you know, I don't think it's the preeminent concern we have right now. I think a bigger concern for us is trying to make sure we maintain listenership and how, as I said, we move across all these various multiple platforms and make the best use of them to get our product out to the, the widest audience. So I don't know if that answered your question. If you have a follow-up, that's fine. I, I, I would agree with that. I think, um, you know, the whole, when I think about looking at influences on content, um, I am always very interested at the journalistic sort of individual level. You know, how do individual journalists um, respond to, you know, whatever the varying pressures are, whether it's who's funding their organization or, or what have you. And um, I think that the structure of the organization is sort of the most important piece of it, but that individual journalists aren't thinking about that every day. That is, so I think, um, you know, I know when I was a journalist, whether I was working um, for a PBS station, because I worked in both commercial and not in, in, you know, in the, in the PBS NPR kind of model, those pressures didn't feel any different. Sort of the people above me were kind of determining those things. But I do think that if you think about how news has become a commodity and can become sort of profitable, then you do have to think about maybe how that can filter down and impact content. I mean, to me, the, the best example of that is the cable news channels. You know, so Fox News has sort of one kind of idea, and a lot of the journalists I know who have worked there say they feel that and it's a part of how they report the news. And the same is true on the other side with MSNBC when they made a, a conscious decision to sort of change their view. So. I think you always should be aware of where the money is coming from, right? I always, my son comes home, he's only 11, and he tells me all sorts of information, and I always say, what is the source of your information? And he just sort of gives me a puzzled look and you know, <laughs> doesn't appreciate it yet. But I think as you evaluate the quality of your sources of information, you should always know, you know, sort of what's pushing it, whether it's, you know, government funding, which to Jack's point in this case isn't, isn't a lot. But it might be if you're evaluating the quality, for example, of news coming out of Syria by the Syrian government. I mean. That's a different way to think about a state model. So I think it's relevant, but it doesn't necessarily preclude that it's having an impact directly on content. Yeah, I mean, I will say I've never in the 15 years now that I've been at NPR have anyone tell me, you can't do this story, you shouldn't do this story, don't do this story. All right, well, those are some awesome questions. We would just like to thank our speakers on behalf of PRSSA. We have some lovely t-shirts and scarves for them. <laughs> So thank you all for coming out, and thank all of you for coming out as well. And we hope to see you in the spring for our, our spring speaker. Thank you. Have a nice night. Thank you. <laughs>